So uh, hi there, Donald. It's uh, really great to see you again. Yeah. Hi, David. It's a pleasure. Yes. And uh, my name is uh, David Feidler. I'm the editor of the Stoic Insights website. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking with uh, Donald Robertson, who's the foremost authority on the relationship between Stoicism and modern psychology. And he's the author of half a dozen books. Uh, I'll list them below the video. But um, I did want to mention a couple of uh, his books that I highly recommend. Uh, one of them is called Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. And it's a very, very uh, clearly written guide to uh, the entire philosophy of Stoicism. It's very easy to digest. I really highly re recommend that. And then the other book, of course, is uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And if you've had any exposure to Stoicism at all over the last year, then uh, you've probably seen this book, and I very highly recommend it. It's very well written, very beautifully written. And uh, in this discussion, uh, we're going to be talking about the relationships between uh, Stoicism, the emotions, how negative emotions come into being and how to manage them, and the influence of um, ancient Stoic philosophy on modern psychotherapy. And uh, there is actually a uh, very strong influence there. And you have, if you haven't read Donald's books, you've probably not heard about it. So we'll go into that. But uh, beforehand, uh, how are you doing in uh, Canada, Donald, with the pandemic? Because uh, we're recording this in the middle of uh, April and every, everything is uh, locked down. Are you okay there? We're doing it in the time of pandemic. It's, do you know, well, as a writer and somebody who works online a lot, it's, it's not made that much difference to my daily routine. I'm cooped up most of the time at my laptop anyway, so I barely noticed the difference. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we certainly are. We're living through interesting times. And I like to say to people, you know, you, that maybe this is a little bit of a stretch, but you could potentially regard the meditations of Marcus Aurelius as, in part at least, his attempt to apply Stoic philosophy to the, the time of the Antonine Plague, the, the pandemic that he was living through, although he only really explicitly mentions it once, you can nevertheless see what's going on in that book as a, a guide to coping with the pandemic. That's right. part of what he was doing. And eventually it ended up killing him, unfortunately. Um, so Donald, if it's okay with you, I'd like to start off with a brief story about something I experienced when uh, reading your uh, most recent book, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was reading your book, um, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, and in the last chapter, Marcus Aurelius is on his deathbed, uh, dying, and his life is flashing before his eyes, and it's very beautifully written. And uh, the ideas of Stoic philosophy are going through his mind, as well as the Stoic philosophical exercises. And um, it's so beautifully and powerfully written because you know his work so well, that you were like, it was like being inside his mind and you were really able to capture his voice. And I have to admit that when I was reading that, it was very powerful and I felt sort of like tears welling up in my eyes. And uh, I'm sure that I'm not the only reader that had that experience. And uh, since we're talking about stoicism and the emotions, what I wanted to uh, ask you is, is there anything unstoic about feeling emotions uh, like that? You know, that, you, that's a really, really good question. And I'd n I had never really thought about the final chapter like that. It is very much designed to evoke an emotional reaction. And so there is a kind of paradox about that. And I, you know, if you'll forgive me if sometimes I like to answer questions in a slightly roundabout way. So I, I'll, if you'll permit me a slight digression, I just wanted to mention that in the Roman histories, I think it's in the Historia Augusta, and actually in one of our other sources, we're told at least twice, maybe three times, that Marcus Aurelius wept in public, right? which might be something that people would be interested in knowing. And in the Historia Augusta, we're told that he wept when one of his tutors died. We don't mm. know which one it was, like, you know, possibly one of his Stoic mentors or tutors. And the, the palace uh, servants tried to restrain him because they were embarrassed. They thought he was, uh, it wasn't becoming of a future emperor uh, to show emotion like that. And Antoninus Pius, his adoptive father, reputedly said, let him be, because philosophy can't take away natural affection of this kind. It's a, a natural emotional response. Mm. 
And uh, I think the Stoics would say the same thing. I mean, very, very simply, the way that I see the, the Stoic attitude towards emotion, and there may be some scope for interpretation. It may be that different Stoics differed about this. But I, it seems to me that the Stoics want to say that there are reflex-like natural emotional reactions that we have, first of all. A little bit more of a complex picture of that. But basically, we, we, there are certain emotional reactions that we even share with animals. So uh, an animal that loses its offspring might be sad, or an, an animals experience fear and frustration and anger. At least the kind of prototypes of those emotions, the precursors of them. And I think the Stoics want to say, like in that famous passage in Seneca, where he says, look, you know, a, an animal like a deer that sees a predator will become startled and anxious and then run away. But the difference is it ret then it will return naturally to grazing when the threat is gone. Whereas humans are cursed with reason as well as being blessed by it. And so we continue to ruminate about things in the past and worry about things in the future. And I think the Stoics would say, look, it's okay to have these kind of natural reflex-like emotions. They're a physiological phenomenon. In the sense, they're indifferent morally. But what we shouldn't do is amplify them unnecessarily or perpetuate them unnecessarily. And in some ways that actually kind of fits in with, a, the Romans had this concept that went all the way back to King Numa, the founder of their religion, that they had a prescribed number of days or months for mourning. And it would depend actually on the age of the person that you were mourning. And so they, they had this kind of idea that there was an appropriate duration that grief might go on for, it was natural. And then beyond that limits, it was starting to become pathological or unhealthy potentially, which is a very simplistic way of understanding it. But nevertheless, I think that's what the Stoics have in mind. You know, they don't want to eliminate all emotion, but they want to prevent us from indulging in unhealthy emotions or allowing our, our emotions to overwhelm our reason. Right. So uh, the reason I raise that question is uh, one of the points that you often make is that um, the word Stoic today means something totally different than what it meant in the ancient world in terms of being a philosophical school. And people have this very misguided notion that uh, Stoics should never experience emotions or be sort of like uh, intellectually detached and Spock-like about everything. But uh, like Epictetus said, uh, he said, you know, Stoics are not unfeeling uh, like a statue. And there's that, uh, that other quote uh, that you know from uh, Seneca, that no school has more love uh, yeah. for human beings than the Stoics uh, did. And um, Marcus has um, this uh, passage where he talks about one of his uh, Stoic teachers as uh, being free from passion mm -hmm. and yet full of love for others. And I was wondering if you could explain what the Stoics uh, meant by passion, because that's another word that doesn't actually correlate with our modern word emotion or our, our modern word passion. They meant something very uh, specific by that. I, do you know, do you, here's another little aside for you. That particular passage in Marcus Aurelius, where he, he talks about one of his Stoic tutors being free from passion and yet full of love, full of philostorgia, I think is the word that he uses, natural affection. Um, I think I, gave, I mentioned that in a talk or something at one of the conferences in John Sellers, um, one, of, one of our uh, modern Stoicism team, one of the leading authors on Stoicism said to me, that's a great passage to mention when people are confused. He goes, yeah, that's the one you should, you should mention that passage to people to deal with this misconception that Stoicism is about being unemotional and having a stiff upper lip. And so it, it does, it should strike people as paradoxical if they think that being free from passion means eliminating or uprooting all emotion. It's a contradiction. How can you be completely free of any emotion and yet full of love? It's because in part the Stoics, you know, when they talk about the passions, they're predominantly referring to what they consider to be unhealthy passions. And actually there's a passage in Diogenes Laertius <coughs> Unfortunately, it's kind of tucked away in this sort of secondary source where they, a lot of the juicy uh, bits about Stoicism are, are not in Seneca or Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, but kind of tucked away in, in some of these other sources. And he says in there that the Stoics referred to the, the passions as being unnatural, excessive, and irrational. And that would fit in very neatly with a kind of modern cognitive therapy conception. It's particularly unhealthy, 
irrational, excessive emotions that we'd be targeting or looking at. And, you know, I, I, again, I have this kind of simplistic way of understanding what the Stoics say about emotions. It's reasonably accurate, but it's a, it's a little bit of a simplification, maybe. And I would say the Stoics want to divide emotions into good, bad, and indifferent ones. You know, so it's actually a bit more nuanced than people might realize at first. So there are these unhealthy passions. And confusingly, they just use the word, the unqualified term passion to refer to them. This is just maybe an idiosyncrasy in a way of the Greek language. Um, that they use, the, they use this word, which sounds like it means all emotion, but really they're using it to refer to unhealthy emotions. And they contrast it with eupatheiai, which means this qualified use of the word, which means healthy passions, rational, moderate uh, emotions. And then also the propathei, or the precursors of emotion, the reflex-like ones. So in addition to, so the, the, the unhealthy emotions that the Stoics want us to deal with, irrational, excessive, and then they want us not just to eliminate all emotion, but to replace them with these healthy ones that are moderated by wisdom that would be appropriate to the wise man or woman. And they also want us to be neutral or indifferent or accepting towards this other level of emotion, the precursors or first movements or proto-passions. And I like to emphasize that because it's really integral actually to modern cognitive theories of emotion. We would look at it in a similar way that many people, uh, it's fundamental in a way actually, that many people um, exacerbate mental health problems by trying too hard to control what we would call automatic thoughts and feelings that, mm. that aren't directly under their voluntary control. So stoicism could become toxic if it was misinterpreted to mean that it requires an effort to suppress or control these propathei, um, these involuntary emotional responses, when in fact, uh, particularly there's, a, again, a fragment um, attributed to Epictetus from one of the lost books of the discourses. It's quoted in Aulus Gellius, um, a Roman grammarian, and he tells a, slightly, a, a great story about how he was on a boat with a, a famous uh, Stoic teacher from Athens who he doesn't name. So we can have fun kind of trying to figure out who he was talking about, if it's someone we even know. And uh, he says they were caught in a storm and everyone was freaking out. They all thought they were going to die. And then they got to shore and uh, Gellius approaches this guy and he says, listen, I recognize you, you're a Stoic teacher. And he says, I, I wanted to ask you that, you know, that you weren't running around and screaming like everyone else, but you were shaking and you turned pale and you were obviously scared like the rest of us. How is that compatible with Stoicism? And the guy reached in his satchel and took out one of the books of Epictetus and quoted it to Gellius and explained to him that the Stoics teach that there are these natural, involuntary, automatic, reflex-like emotions, which he says need to be accepted as natural and inevitable and the difference, as we said earlier, with the Stoic wise man or woman is that they don't then ruminate about these things or exacerbate them. He was experiencing seasickness and anxiety like everyone else, but he wasn't uh, you know, running around complaining about it and screaming and making things even worse than they needed to be. So I, again, unfortunately, you know, maybe our best explanation of this is in one of the more obscure uh, Stoic fragments. Yeah, one of um, the things that really helped me to understand what the Stoics meant by passion was uh, reading John Sellers. And uh, what John Sellers says is that the um, <clears throat> a passion is always a violent emotion. And it's so violent that it overcomes your uh, ability to think rationally. Uh, so I, I found that to be uh, very help, helpful. There's and, another uh, analogy they have to describe it, which comes from, I, I like to think there's a kind of hidden story or a subtext to Stoicism, which we have to speculate about, but it's fun and tempting to do that. Mm -hmm. So we know that Chrysippus was a long distance runner, we're told. And the, there are a number of recurring metaphors in Stoicism. They have these metaphors about sailing and uh, metaphors about the military and stuff, but they also have a number of references to walking and running which I'd love to think I'll go back to Chris Ipus and, you know, maybe this is him talking about his experience as a, a long distance runner. And one of them is that he says that the passions are like somebody who's running so fast that they're no longer able to stop or change direction. And this comes back to what you said about the passions kind of overwhelming reason and, and, and you know, like, uh, like anger being, or any passion 
we it's the stoic say of anger that it's temporary madness but all the passions are temporary madness as far as the stoics are concerned because they make us less rational and that's very consistent it's a fascinating way of uh, framing something that's very familiar in modern cognitive psychology which is that strong emotions introduce pronounced attentional and cognitive biases and what we call cognitive distortions or thinking errors it's interesting because in it just at a kind of brass tacks level when you're talking to clients in therapy you know often people uh reminding me a little bit of the, the aristotelians maybe you know people often say well maybe anger is a useful emotion and one of the strongest counter arguments against that in practice is just to say to people but but anger introduces cognitive distortions people are, are clearly prone to over generalization black and white thinking jumping to conclusions when they're angry so we become inherently less rational the more angry we allow ourselves to get and it inhibits rational problem solving and things like that and it also does weird things to our focus of attention so so when you take a step back and you think about those qualities of strong emotions the stoics were onto something you know we do become more irrational and that you can is that's obvious when you look at someone else who's angry we don't notice it as much when we're the ones that are angry right we kind of lack that self-awareness but when you look at other people who are losing their temper it becomes obvious that they jump to conclusions and make sweeping generalizations and stuff like that they're not thinking clearly and as lovers of wisdom as philosophers this should be anathema to us we, we, we want to you know reason is very precious to us okay so uh could you explain uh, to us what the cognitive uh theory of emotion is and how that actually originated from the stoics because i find that to be uh, totally fascinating, and uh, most people probably have not heard about that. Well, it's a great question as well. Um, I, you know, I've I've told this story a zillion times, but the, there are many people aren't aware of it, and I guess it it is a very important thing because people might say, "Well, why is Stoicism going through a renaissance?" And it's partly because of this. So, um, where to begin? Let's begin with Albert Ellis, right? So we. Freudian psychoanalysis in the middle of the 20th century dominated psychotherapy. And then, cut a long story short, I love that I could go into great detail about this, but I'll give you the abbreviated version. So there was a, a psychoanalytic therapist called Albert Ellis, uh, who became disillusioned with the whole Freudian approach, like many people at the time, in the, in the 1950s. And uh, Ellis decided, he did something I always think is very admirable. He said, I'm going to start again from scratch. You know, I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm done trying to kind of like tweak this and fix it. I'm going to scrap the whole thing and just have a break and then go back to it like a blank slate and just build a whole new psychotherapy from scratch. Because this, these existing approaches just are not working out for me. They're inherently flawed. And he read Marcus Aurelius when he was a teenager. And he drew on stoicism and other things, but to a large extent, he drew on Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. He, he doesn't mention Seneca much, so I don't think he'd really read Seneca, interestingly. But he, and he was particularly drawn to a very famous quote from Epictetus. It's passage five of the Enchiridion, and it says, it's not events that upset us or distress us, but our opinions about them. And I would dub that the most famous Stoic quote, at least in the field of CBT. Every CBT practitioner knows that quote. If, and, and probably for 99% of them, that's the only thing they know about Stoicism, is just that quote, but they should all know it. So he, Ellis- He even used to uh, give that quotation to his clients though, didn't he? He taught it to, as far as I'm aware, like, he taught it to all of his clients. He implies he taught it to all of them and to students. And he quotes it, I think, in most of his, he wrote many books and, you know, I, maybe he even quotes it in all of his books. He quotes it in most of them. So it's absolutely pervasive in what came to be known as rational emotive behavior therapy, which is either the first form of CBT or the main precursor of CBT, depending on how you look at it. And so, you know, Ellis built a whole therapy around this. Now, this is important because... Um, at the time in psychology, there was, from research on psychology and the emotions, there was an emerging theory of emotion called the cognitive theory of emotion, the cognitive appraisal theory of emotion. And it was part of what was known as the cognitive revolution in psychology. And so Ellis was kind of riding the crest of that wave, as it were, and also happened to connect it to ancient stoicism. And he said, look, this is just a, a simplified, this quote just provides a convenient way, a simplified way 
of teaching people about a theory that's, that's now well established in psychological research, which is the idea that our emotions are determined, not exclusively, but to a large extent, to a crucial extent, by corresponding beliefs. So for example, shock horror, somebody who's anxious probably believes that something bad is about to happen. And they might be wrong about that, right? right. So I'll give it, in therapy that's critical because people who have panic attacks, often but not always, believe that they're gonna have a heart attack and die. And they're you know, invariably wrong about that. Like panic attacks feel like you're having a heart attack, but you're not actually. Um, so it's a kind of false alarm. So people have a mistaken or a false belief about what's actually about to happen. And so I let, the, my favorite way of explaining this is that when clients come into therapy, they'll spend a long time in the initial session talking about their anger, fear, or sadness and how it's making their life miserable, affecting them at work, destroying their relationships, and all the negative consequences of it, right? And then it, it'll become evident just from the stuff they're saying that the these emotions are a big problem. So inevitably, they'll start to think, I guess I should get rid of this anger or fear or sadness or whatever, do something about it. But then they'll, at some point in the session, they'll usually attempt to justify it by saying, I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's excessive, unhealthy and irrational, but, and this is a critical chess move that they make, it's just how I feel. Right? right? So their way of defending it, sort of ending the conversation is to say, I can't do anything about it, right? It's just how I feel. Why I'm stuck with the anger that I have, the depression or whatever, even though it's got all these terrible consequences for me and I should want to get rid of it. And Ellis, one of the ways Ellis would respond to that would be to say, yes, but, you know, it's not just how you feel, it's also how you think. And that's a neat way of encapsulating the cognitive theory of emotion, because as soon as people recognize that the fear isn't just a feeling, it also is constituted by certain underlying beliefs, those beliefs have truth value. And that means you can question whether they're actually accurate or not. That now gives you leverage that you didn't have before. Because if they go, it's just a feeling, can't do anything about it. But if you go, no, you believe something bad is going to happen, and you might be wrong about that, or you might be exaggerating it or you might be hastily jumping to, you know, now we can pull that apart. And it opens a whole repertoire of therapeutic techniques that we can now deploy in the session. That now we have opened the gates to cognitive therapy from that simple observation alone that it's not just a feeling. You know, feelings are thoughts, feelings are beliefs, or at least they're, they're very closely connected with them. And the Stoics knew that two and a half, you know, 2,300 years ago. Um, and it's shocking that for over half a century, psychotherapists kind of ignored this, or, or most of them did. Yeah, it's really amazing because, uh, you know, the ancient Stoics believed that basically uh, all uh, strong emotions or passions actually came from opinions or intellectual judgments. And for example, uh, like Seneca talks about the judgment when people feel angry, they always feel uh, that the main judgment behind anger, for example, is, is that I've been harmed in some sense. And then they want to uh, achieve some kind of uh, revenge. And um, I have a story um, in this book I'm writing on Seneca. Uh, I have a couple of chapters. One is how to overcome worry and anxiety. And another one is on anger. But to sort of like illustrate this idea that judgments are behind emotions, let's say that you're walking down the street one day and it's raining and there's a big puddle and a car goes by and splashes you. Well, how you react is really based on the kind of judgment that you make about that because you could just say, oh, I just got splashed by a car. But another person could say, oh, damn you, you've ruined my day. And so that person feels that they've been harmed. And because of that, uh, a passion is generated and, uh, you know, who knows, they might try to take revenge on the, um, <laughs> the automobile uh, driver. But uh, it goes to show you that if you understand the judgments behind, uh, you know, these very powerful emotions that we have, you can actually disable the emotions. And in fact, um, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius is about this. He says, uh, get rid of the judgment and then you're rid of the I am hurt and get rid of the I am hurt and then you're rid of the hurt itself. That's right. 
Yeah. Then that passage, he echoes this, you know, what, what was clearly a kind of established cognitive formula, theory of anger that the Stoics had, because you're right, it's the same, you know, exactly the, the same idea as, as in Seneca and in other, uh, other writings that we have. I, Aaron Beck's example of this, again, is also very, very simplistic. If I remember rightly, the way that he used to explain it, so the founder of cognitive therapy, to his clients, he would say something like, imagine you're in your bed at night and you hear this kind of creaking of the, the floorboards. And so you, you kind of half asleep and you, 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 you think you've heard uh, um, somebody, you know, broken into your home. And so you're, you're anxious and you're maybe angry and you kind of get in your uh, dressing gown or whatever. And you kind of like have a, you, you go and check out downstairs or whatever and look around your house to try and find out what it is. Um, so you're feeling anxiety because you've heard somebody walking around in your house in the middle of the night, right? And then you realize that the creaking is just caused by the radiators coming on or something like that, right? And then as soon as you realize that there's an alternative explanation, then you, and then, and then you know, to be as accurate as we can about this, because having explained this a zillion times to clients in therapy, you know, of course, yeah, it might still take a while for you to calm down, but nevertheless, you know, having now just, as you said, as Marcus puts it, just eliminated that judgment. You know, there isn't somebody in the house. It was something else that caused it. It would be surprising if the anger and anxiety continued regardless. Like, it might carry on. It might take, a, you know, a few minutes or whatever for you to calm down. But it's going to go away because you now realize you were wrong. You were mistaken about what you thought you heard. And so that's like a really clear example. I mean, obviously, emotions are a little bit more complex than that. Um, there are some emotions that are that seem less cognitively mediated. So, for example, if someone runs up behind you and goes "boo," you know, you'll you'll jump out of your skin and your heart will start racing and stuff. And that's anxiety that doesn't seem particularly cognitively mediated. It's more like a, a reflex response. But nevertheless, generally speaking, most of the emotions that we struggle with seem to be heavily cognitively mediated, and it's clear. We also have this outcome research from cognitive therapy that shows that when you actually do sit down and you know try to work on emotions with people it does typically you know change the way that they feel we you know it's the we have research as we like to put it sometimes in, in psychotherapy um that that addresses both the idea that cognition is the cause and the cure of pathological emotions so we can look at people that have pathological emotions and we can identify that they're suffering also from distorted thinking, but we can also try changing those thoughts and then see that that has a positive effect on their mood. Right. There's also uh, that famous quote <clears throat> attributed to uh, Viktor Frankl uh, that goes uh, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And uh, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And actually, <clears throat> I did a bit of research into that. It turns out that Viktor Frankl actually didn't say that. It seems to go back to Rollo May. That's like a, a long story. Start from Rollo May, really cool. Yeah, uh, and it, you know, they're, again, it's surprising that these guys. I don't think Rollo May had read the Stoics either. There's no hint that, that Viktor Frankl, as far as I'm aware, had ever read the Stoics. But many, you know, everyone that reads Frankl thinks, well, he sounds like, in many respects, he sounds like he's he's saying the same things. But then that's maybe maybe David. That's because the Stoics hit on something that that was true. Uh, they yes. they they hit this kind of vein of perennial wisdom, and so it wouldn't be surprising. And actually, I'll say something about that in regard to cognitive therapy, the the relationship between the two. So Ellis read the Stoics, and he he there's a shared the the key thing is the fun the fundamental premise of cognitive therapy is the cognitive theory of emotion. Everything else stems from that, and that is in part derived from the Stoics, it's shared with the Stoics. It's the same premise, essentially, that the Stoics adopt. So for that, from that same foundation, you're going to arrive at similar conclusions. So partly it's because cognitive therapy has the same premise, like the same starting point as Stoicism, it arrives at some similar conclusions. Partly Ellis directly borrowed certain ideas from Stoicism. And then partly also he probably kind of indirectly absorbed ideas from Stoicism. You know, he kind of took, picked up the flavor of it and, and it influenced him in a more roundabout way. And then you have the subsequent generation of cognitive therapists, I should say that, you know, Beck had read the Stoics and mentions them very fleetingly. Um, but surprisingly, uh, I, 
hardly any other cognitive behavioral therapy authors appear to have read the Stoics at all. It's, it, that's one of those paradoxes, even though it's so fundamentally important to the origin of the whole CBT approach. It's like Ellis read the Stoics and then nobody else bothered reading them. But they often reinvent ideas that, you can, that can be found in Stoicism because they've started off from the same perspective. Well, that's a good uh, argument for why uh, cognitive behavioral therapists uh, should read your books. And uh, one of the first books that you wrote, I think it was the first book that I read, is actually called The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And uh, that talks about this, the uh, you know, stoic elements and cognitive behavioral therapy. When I was uh, researching uh, this interview with you, I read about Albert Ellis's uh, ABC model of uh, beliefs and emotion. Uh, and I was reading about it um, online and also in uh, the book by your friend, uh, Jules Evans. And uh, that seems to have been based straight on uh, Epictetus. And so what Ellis says is there's an ABC sequence. There's like an activating event, which is A. B, there's a belief, which would also be like a judgment. And then there are consequences. And depending on the belief you have, that will determine the emotional consequences. So I might make this into a graphic to flash over the screen on the yeah. video. But then if you look at Epictetus, it's exactly the same phenomenon or the same structure rather. So uh, with Epictetus, you have impressions, mm -hmm. which are uh, perceptions of external or internal events. And then you have you know, a judgment or an opinion that you give assent to. And then if uh, the judgment is incorrect, then that will result in a passion or a negative emotion. So that's like taken straight out of the start. So I was really amazed to... Uh, you mentioned Seneca earlier in on, on Anger as well. And actually in, in On Anger, there's a passage where he describes it in very similar terms as well as kind of a three-step uh, right. model. That, right. that I, when I read that, I think, geez, that looks like it's come out of a CBT book, but he's straight up describing a, a, a yeah. cognitive model there. Um, and I, I just, I just in passing, I want to say, like in, the, in therapy field, people, there's a bunch of different ABC models, but this is the most famous one. And the reason they say ABC, it's like, kiddies building blocks and so the the idea is we have these complex nuanced theories that emerge from research and psychology and then the weird thing about being a therapist is you you have to read all this stuff and train in it and then you sit in a little room with one person after another and uh, and then you have to kind of somehow try and uh, what's the expression sort of translate that into layman's terms over and over again so part of the job of being a therapist is taking complex technical research-based ideas and, and just trying to put them in plain English. And, and so Ellis's way of doing that is to go, look, it's A, B, C, like simple as that, you know? And then, now, so we have to, the reason I'm saying that is that the actual research is more complex and more right. nuanced. And so sometimes people say, well, that's a bit of a simplification, isn't it? There are some exceptions and there's more to it than that. It's a deliberate simplification because it has to be made fairly simple in order to explain it in a few minutes to every random client that you meet in a, in a consulting room. Right. And, so and plus, if you're like a, um, if you're a psychotherapist, you can use that to get your clients to actually under, uh, examine their underlying beliefs as well. But I'll tell you something that Ellis never said, right? So they, they also the other thing about this is, you know, it lends itself to being drawn on a flip chart. And therapists love these little diagrams and things. This, again, is their attempt to make it really simple. Let's draw a little picture of it. And uh, they, we call this the orientation stage of therapy or the socialization phase of therapy. So the client just wrapping their head around the basic premise of everything that they're then going to go on and do. So to do therapy, you have to kind of buy into the, the, the concepts that it's based on. That usually happens at the beginning with these kind of this is the ABC model, right? That's the basis of what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. Now, Ellis never had this realization, really, that um, as Beck um, put it, <laughs> in, order to, in order to dispute, uh, cognitive therapy largely consists in questioning the evidence, um, disputing the, the truth uh, of certain beliefs that clients hold. And as Beck said, in order to do that, clients have to be able to view their beliefs as if they were hypothesis, as if they're up for debate. Um, there's a difference between somebody who says when they lose their job, this is a catastrophe, 
and they just they believe that's just the way it is. It actually is a catastrophe. And someone who thinks I'm viewing it as a catastrophe, but maybe someone else might view it differently. So let's evaluate the evidence for how catastrophic it is, or let's evaluate the pros and cons of, of, view, of interpreting it that way. So at the beginning of therapy, as part of the socialization phase, there's this idea that we have to kind of prize away, like peel away people's judgments from the events themselves. They have to be able to detach their opinions from external events, separate them enough. And Beck called this cognitive distancing. Uh, behavioral psychologists call the same thing verbal defusion. So our judgments become fused with reality as if there's no separation between them. And the, the, the starting point of therapy requires having enough separation that we can at least begin to treat them as if they're up for debate and start evaluating the evidence for those beliefs. Now, what Ellis didn't realize it took a younger generation of therapists who came later. Um, they, people start to, started to say, well, hang on a minute. What happens if that's all you do, right? What happens if you just spend more time getting people to separate their judgments from reality and you don't even bother questioning the evidence for them? Because it seems to us, like once you've made that separation, then and the, the, the belief isn't fused with reality anymore. The, the, the emotion response is, is watered down anyway. Um, and maybe you don't even then need to get into the lost in the weeds of weighing up the evidence because that can be a lengthy process. It can be a confusing process. And that's the beginning of what we call the third wave in cognitive behavioral therapy. It started about 15, 20 years ago. And uh, it became tied up with Buddhist mindfulness meditation because, again, as often the case, people started, there were two things and, and people inevitably saw, hang on, these two things are really similar. So people that were doing Buddhist meditation thought, in meditation, you don't start questioning and analyzing all your thoughts. You just take a step back from them and view them in a more detached manner. And so if you were doing more of this initial step in therapy, it would be kind of a bit like what you do when you're practicing mindfulness meditation. Now, one of the paradoxes about this relationship between Stoicism and CBT is that when Ellis and Beck drew inspiration from the Stoics, they ignored a lot of what the Stoics said. And one of the things that they ignored was the Stoics' emphasis on a continual separation of our judgments from external reality and a continual prosoche or attention to our faculty of judgment, uh, hegemonicon, they call it. Um, and so I would argue that this kind of mindfulness practice was already in Stoicism, you know, in a sense, and that the founders of cognitive therapy just didn't think it was important. And it took the later generation who hadn't read the Stoics, rediscovered it in the form of Buddhist mindfulness, but they could have just gone back to the Stoics and they would have found the same idea or a similar idea there to begin with. And so when people read the Stoics, they might say, but there's not, the Stoics, in some respects, are questioning the, the beliefs that people hold, their value judgments. But not in the same way that cognitive therapists do. There's not the same weighing up of evidence that you find in cognitive therapy. And that's because the Stoics were targeting things at a much more fundamental level. They wanted to question whether the value judgments that we make... Um, so a, a cognitive therapist might say, look, is this event really as catastrophic as you think it is? Whereas the Stoics would want to say, are any events catastrophic if they're external? Why like, uh, they would target it at a more philosophical level, a, a deeper, uh, a, a meta-ethical level. You could say they might. The Stoics would say those kind of values don't apply to any external events. Um, so you guys are getting too lost in the weeds or the minutiae. You know, this is an across-the-board thing. Like nothing is that bad in life. Um, and so. I, I guess we also forgot something about stoicism when we, uh, when cognitive therapists got their hands on it. Right. Um, there are a couple of uh, letters from Seneca where he's responding to questions uh, his friend uh, Lucilius brings up. And uh, some of Seneca's responses actually resemble kind of like little psychotherapy sessions where he's trying to get him to examine his underlying judgments and, uh, things like that. Um, it seems that there is a little difference between uh, like, uh, so with like Epictetus, he's saying that you always need to be monitoring your judgment. So that's like prosoke. And uh, 
it's sort of like, I guess that's sort of like Socratic, you know, questioning of your underlying beliefs. And uh, in, my, in my study of Stoicism, uh, I can't really go and give the full explanation of it, but what I've come to realize is that uh, the, the ancient Stoics uh, actually saw Stoicism as a way of liberating yourself from the slavery of bad judgments and cognitive errors that lead to negative emotions. Yeah. Yeah, de- absolutely. Well, you know, like obviously Epictetus, uh, you know, notoriously, I guess, keeps... And we have these, these are kind of transcripts from Ariane of his lectures. He keeps calling his students slaves, which is obviously an irony because like, he was a former slave and most of them were probably uh, like aristocrats or, you know, uh, wealthy uh, Greeks and Romans. And, uh, and yet, I, ironically, this guy um, who came from a, a much lower grade in society is, keeps calling them slaves all the time. Um, and that's because he's referring to this idea that they're enslaved by their emotions and trying to really kind of shock them into realizing that true slavery is is a state of mind yes and epictetus was a slave who became freed as well and uh the the uh, first sentence in seneca's letters to lucilius uh he talks lucilius you must free yourself from the situation and the word that he uses is actually the word that's used in terms of like freeing slaves because Lucilius had become enslaved to his sort of like personal life situation. He was like very uh, successful, um, but he had ignored his inner life. So part of the project of the letters is like, how do you uh, free yourself from the way that you've enslaved yourself to these certain uh, situations? But uh, to go back to cognitive behavioral therapy, there are a lot of statistics uh, floating around about how really effective it is, especially in treating anxiety and I was wondering if you could just talk about that yeah gosh I mean that's that's a whole can of worms it's quite a big complicated question and that I know there's some debate about it occasionally you'll get people who are, are kind of on the skeptical side and they'll go, oh, I don't really know if it's as effective as people say but the shorthand answer to it is especially when we're, I, you know I, I feel quite strongly about this when we're talking about um, healthcare in general you know also we live in this era of fake news and, and so on and there is scope for debate, you know, but sometimes people, it's like climate skeptics and stuff like that, you know, people are entitled to be skeptical about things. We need that. We need to have healthy debate. But it's important for people to realize that the people who question the evidence are kind of in the minority, you know, and that's a bit of a, like, you know, that, that's a contentious view that the weight of scientific evidence is behind the conclusion that, generally speaking, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is the leading evidence-based form of modern psychotherapy. And for that reason, um, you know, the NHS in the UK predominantly use CBT across the board for mental health. Everything has to be driven by very thoroughly, you know, like very rigorous scientific research. And their conclusion is that CBT is the, the main modality of therapy generally speaking. And also most insurers will mainly like, or sometimes only fund uh, treatment using CBT uh, because it's an evidence-based approach. They don't want to fund forms of psychotherapy that lack an evidence base. And you know, the other thing I'd say about that is that CBT in a sense isn't one therapy. It's kind of misleading um, because the idea behind it is that it's an evidence-based approach to psychotherapy. And there are hundred, I don't know, maybe a hundred or ish. There are dozens and dozens, maybe a hundred or more distinct protocols or, um, you know, each protocol you could say is kind of a therapy. So lots of different forms of CBT. And, and sometimes you wouldn't even recognize that they're part of the same approach. They can be quite different. Um, and some of them are more based on behavioral psychology and some of them are more based on cognitive psychology. There's quite a lot of rivalry between those two perspectives. And then there's rivalry between the older, what we call the second wave approaches, represented by Beck and Ellis and our followers, and then the more recent, what we call the third wave, or mindfulness and acceptance-based approaches. So the CBT field itself is actually quite diverse. Right. And right. every distinct condition, there are a bunch of different protocols. So there's different therapies for different, different problems. Um, and overall, you know, and, but then equally, uh, with a, I, I, I wouldn't want to get too lost in the weeds of this, but I'm, I just want people to realize, again, it's a little bit complex and a little bit nuanced. CBT is better for some things than for others. 
there are certain problems that are inherently much easier to treat than others. I'm always shocked that, yeah, I used to train psychotherapists and I was shocked um, when I trained them. I could never wrap my head around the fact that so many of the counselors, coaches and therapists I trained, even the ones that had been doing it for a while, were often oblivious to the fact that there are hugely different success rates for treating different problems. This, this I thought was so fundamental. It baffled me that anybody that worked in the field would not realize it, but I, over and over again, the therapists that I was training were, didn't even know this. Um, and it, that's a shocking level of ignorance, really, but you know, that's the psychotherapy field. It's a mess. Right. And it is, it's a lot better now than it was 20 years ago. But the, um, you know, for example, you mentioned anxiety. Um, there, are, there are conditions where we have an almost 90% success rate. Um, so treating phobia, which is one of the simplest forms of anxiety, it has, you know, can be done in, in three or four hours of treatment and has about a 90% success rate. You know, so again, like in terms of like debating, you know, there's not that much scope. You know, we're fairly certain that we know how some of these problems work and how to, to treat them. We also have quite high success rates in treating insomnia. Social anxiety, we have about a 75% success rate in treating. But then more complex, more generalized problems like generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, clinical depression, we have a lower success rate. You know, it might be more like sort of 50 or 60%. Like, so these are harder problems to treat. They usually take more therapy. We're still kind of trying, there, there's more competing theories and protocols. So it's not a level playing field, you know. And uh, one of the things I would say is that, you know, in actual fact, although there is good reason to, to believe that the cognitive approach is effective, there's thousands of studies like looking at it from different perspectives. But nevertheless, it would be true to say that some of the most effective interventions in the CBT field are actually more of the behavioral interventions. So the, the most robustly supported the treatment technique in the entire field of psychotherapy is exposure therapy for anxiety. And uh, that's based you know, pretty much in, entirely on, on a behavioral psychology model. It's just the simple observation that when somebody has anxiety, if they expose themselves to the thing that causes their anxiety, if they've got cat phobia, if they go in a room with cats in it, and they wait for long enough, and they do that repeatedly under controlled conditions, that eventually their anxiety would abate naturally. And, uh, you know, I think even the Stoics were aware of this. Uh, Premeditatio malorum. Yeah. So one of the really cool things that you do in your book on Marcus Aurelius is uh, you talk about Marcus's ideas and then uh, you go on to, to show how they correspond to like modern ideas and cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's very interesting. It makes it very um, modern. But uh, this uh, technique of uh, pre premeditatio malorum, I guess it actually goes back to the cynics, but the Stoics... Uh, adopted it wholeheartedly and it's basically imagining uh you know unfortunate things that could happen to you so that you would be emotionally uh ready for them when they do and that would uh, reduce the emotional blow of them and so so uh what you're saying then is that uh, that that relates to uh this technique that you mentioned in cognitive behavioral therapy I mean, again, this is a weird, shocking thing about the history of psychotherapy. But you, you could, so you might look at the Stoics and think, well, surely, in a sense, this is obvious, right? It's common sense, you might say, that if you expose yourself to things that make you feel anxious and you just wait it out, your anxiety will wear off. Even one of Aesop's fables uses this as its premise. He has the fable, if anyone wants to look it up, about the fox and the lion is clearly predicated on the idea the fox sees a lion in the forest and he's frightened by it and then the next day he goes back again and looks at it from behind the bush and he's still anxious but not as much as before and then the third day he goes back and he's even less anxious and he's able to walk up and become friends with a lion and this is clearly predicated on the idea that repeated prolonged exposure leads to emotional habituation as we would say in the jargon of psychotherapy. So you could say maybe this is a kind of common sense observation that the Stoics seem to have been aware of. And, and, and you could do it in reality. We call that in vivo exposure. But we also know it works almost as well if you just do it in your imagination, which is what the, the Stoics seem to be referring to, particularly Seneca. But then, the, again, the really shocking thing about this is that Freud didn't know that. Like, for half a century, 
like psychotherapy was dominated by these guys that got knighthoods and were lauded as, you know, like uh, eminent psychiatrists and in a sense were oblivious to what for two and a half thousand years to many people just seemed like common sense. You know, that's surprising. When you look back on things, that seems really odd that someone would go to Freud with a cat phobia and Freud would say, this is going to take years. Like, you're going to have to lie on this couch and, and tell me about your dreams in order to deal with this. And it's probably repressed an- castration anxiety. Like, it's got to do with your relationship with the, your, your mum and dad. Uh, whereas, you know, most ordinary people naively would think maybe if you just learn to pick cats up and you're patient and wait it out, you'll get used to them, your anxiety will wear off. But it wasn't until the 1950s, 1960s that psychotherapists rediscovered something which you'd think would be glaringly obvious and which Aesop and the cynics and the Stoics seem to have realized. Yeah, I actually used uh, this technique of uh, premeditatio malorum uh, in regards to my son, who's like about six years old, because... um, On the third floor of our house, we have some wooden stairs leading up there that are extremely dangerous. And I was very concerned about him, uh, you know, when he was a baby, like falling down the stairs. So I did everything that I possibly could rationally to prevent that from happening. So we built a wooden gate at the top and locked it at night so he couldn't like wander down there and fall down the stairs and everything. And when he would go down the stairs in the morning, I would say to him, uh, Benjamin, be sure to uh, hold the railing when you go down. I would say that every single morning, but I kept meditating upon this because I knew that it was inevitable that at some point he would fall down the wooden stairs. It's just a fact of life. I mean, I fell down the stairs when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I figured that by thinking about this on a regular basis that I would be emotionally prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And when he fell down the stairs, I would be able to help him and not panic because I had really thought it through in advance. Whereas I think my wife probably would have never thought about it and she would have been, you know, screaming or something. So uh, it happened actually, uh, you know, a few months ago, he fell down the stairs and he was towards the bottom of them and uh, he got a little scraped up, but it wasn't anything serious. So I felt that uh, it did help me. It could have been much worse. So I'm grateful that didn't happen. Well, you said you mentioned at the start that we're living in the time of pandemic and, uh, you know, at the moment, I'm getting kind of bombarded with people wanting to write articles or design courses about how people can be more resilient during the pandemic. And I, I actually, I tweeted about this the other day, although there are lots of things that we can do to help people. And maybe somebody actually said they thought this was a bit of a glib thing to say, but I mean it very seriously. You know, the, the main way and the, the Stoics would recommend that we learn to be more resilient in a pandemic is to prepare for it in advance. Like it's, you know, it's kind of like the, the, you know, in some respects, the horse is already bolted, you know, uh, it's about, we can, in the middle of the situation, start working in the way we respond to it. But what the Stoics would tell us to do is to prepare long in advance. You know, they would have, uh, Seneca would have said, imagine, you know, that you might get ill, imagine your own death, you know, imagine things like pandemic you know, way before it's uh, even in the news, on the horizon. Right. Um, Because these things are part of life. I actually did that uh, because uh, maybe it was 12 years ago, uh, there was the H1N1 uh, bird flu, which uh, was actually far worse than um, the coronavirus in some ways because it had a 60% mortality rate. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as easily transmissible, but... um, I did take some precautions and I bought, you know, some of those, uh, you know, face masks and things like that. And what Seneca says is that you should imagine uh, everything in, in advance, you know, bad that could happen. So the, the real attitude of the Stoic is that if something like this happens, you should say, I, when it happens, you should say, you know, I expected it to happen. Yeah. And actually in this particular case, that's true because, you know, I've thought that for years, something like this could happen. It was just a matter of time. So. It finally did. And um, I think that helped me to, uh, you know, deal with it because I haven't felt any anxiety about it at all. Of course, I'm careful. (laughs) um, So you mentioned cognitive distancing and uh, there are some uh, uh, 
like philosophical exercises the Stoics used, which uh, relate to that as well. So maybe you could explain, you know, to the listeners uh, how the Stoic, how some of the Stoic philosophical uh, meditations involve a form of cognitive distancing. Well, the main thing. So there are. Let me see. There are many different exercises that the Stoics use. In my first book on Stoicism, I. I listed, I think, about 18 separate psychological strategies that I could identify in the, in the Stoic writings. And over a decade later, I think that list is still pretty much the same in my mind. You know, that, that, that's roundabout right. That's about, you know, some of them divide down more, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different psychological strategies that they use. So specifically to achieve cognitive distance, um, the main one really would just be that quote from Epictetus alone, just telling yourself it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about them, our opinions about them. So sometimes people wouldn't recognize that as being a technique, but it is a technique, like just literally just telling yourself that and understanding it would be enough to gain cognitive distancing. Some techniques in therapy are more concrete than others and some are more abstract, more conceptual. And some people have a hard time understanding that there could be such a thing as a, a technique that consists in just looking at something from a different perspective. But looking at things from that perspective, remembering that quote is perhaps one of the most robust, one of the most powerful techniques in Stoicism. And there are other things that are kind of linked to it. Epictetus also tells his students when they have a, a, a troubling impression. And so uh, I think his long point, A, long maybe it is that points this out, or it might be Pierre Hadot, that seems to imply that that's an impression that's already fused with a judgment of value. Um, so Epictetus says, when you have a, an impression about something that's upsetting you, you should say to yourself, this is just not just an impression and not at all the thing that it claims to represent. And there are two things going on there. He actually he says, you know, you're just an impression. He, talks, he tells his students to talk to the impression. We can call that apostrophizing, like talking to your thoughts. So that kind of objectifies the thought, almost as if you're talking to another person. Um, that, that same technique is actually used in modern third wave cognitive therapy. So you might say, oh, hello thoughts, hello worry, like as if you're talking to them. That encourages you to do this weird mental gymnastics thing that we call cognitive distancing or metacognitive awareness, whereby you now view your thoughts as if you're looking at them from a distance. Um, so you might say, um, I notice now that I'm thinking that this is a catastrophe. And that would be a, another way of viewing your thoughts as an object. So Stoics mention doing this. They say, you're just an impression. You're just a thought and not at all the thing you claim to represent. So reminding yourself that something is a representation and not to fuse it with reality, but also talking to it, apostrophizing it. And then the other thing, which is a very powerful technique, which Epictetus mentions, I don't know if the other Stoics mention this, maybe Seneca does, Marcus doesn't. This is more of a kind of behavioral technique. Um, it's at the borderline between behavior and cognition. So Epictetus several times tells his students that when they're experiencing a strong passion, they should what I would do what I would call postponement. He says, uh, give yourself leisure like, before acting upon it. So we call that a timeout strategy in therapy. Uh, it's used in worry management, anger management quite a lot. So you notice when you're at an early stage, when you're beginning to experience a strong emotion and then suspend your response to it. See, I'll come back to this later. So you notice you're beginning to worry about something. And you go, okay, I'm worrying about money. I'll come back at seven o'clock tonight and I'll sit down and think about this properly. And one of the reasons that that benefits you is it inherently forces you to step out of the thought and view the thought itself as a process or an activity. So you gain cognitive distancing by doing that. But it also means that when you start thinking about it later, another situation that your feelings will have abated to some extent. So the cognition won't be as intense, it won't be as hot as we sometimes say, and you'll be more able to think about it rationally in a detached manner. But the, in terms of cognitive distancing, the thing is by saying, I'm gonna stop thinking about this now, that forces you to step back from the thought and view it almost as if you were viewing something that someone else is doing.
Right, and uh, that relates also uh, to what you talk about in your book on Marcus Aurelius um, about the view from above, as well as uh, what some people call, you know, looking at this, something Marcus Aurelius does a lot is he tries to get out of himself and look at nature from nature's point of view. Because uh, one of the things you point out is that, for example, if you have a very strong emotional feeling or a passion or you're worrying about something, you sort of like close in on yourself. And so one of the techniques you can use is uh, think about the world and your place in nature, but over like vast periods of time. And it makes you feel like you're part of a larger whole, but also that your own worries at the time are less significant. Marcus, Marcus talks about this quite a lot. He does it quite a lot. And sometimes, it, like in Hado talks about it in a kind of literal sense of picturing things from above, like the Zeus looking down from Olympus. Like in all those old films, you know, like Clash of the Titans and stuff, you see the Olympian gods looking at humans as if they're chess pieces or something, or like from this elevated perspective, the tiny humans. And that, that's kind of what it reminds me of. But also, Hado recognized that sometimes when the Stoics or philosophers of other traditions who also do this technique are doing cosmology. Anytime they're doing cosmology at all, they're kind of expanding their perspective and viewing things, you know, the, the process of thinking about the whole of nature as itself could be seen as a contemplative practice. And again, it's really easy for people to kind of you know, brush past this and not really realize how profoundly significant it actually is. But um, the easiest way, I think, to explain it is that, that, you know, again, one of the most robust findings in modern research on psychopathology is that when people are very angry or very anxious in particular, we, we can um, focus our attention in different ways. Um, and we can pay attention to, we can walk and chew gum. We can think about two things at once. You know, you could be driving your car and also thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight, you know, and, and then also kind of having a conversation with somebody in the back seat. So you can, we can do multi, we can multitask, right? We can do several things at once. But people find it harder to do that under stress. So the, the scope of their attention becomes narrowed like a, a laser beam and they become much more selective about the things that they pay attention to. So when someone's really anxious, they, zo like they zoom in on the, the possible signs of threat what we call, it's called threat monitoring in psychology and their environment. And that leads to a form of cognitive distortion called selective thinking. So there might be things in your environment that would actually be evidence of safety that you're now just ignoring because you're just looking at the possible sources of danger. So that might lead you to arrive at very distorted conclusions, very distorted perceptions of your environment. And so generally, not just when they're talking about cosmology or picturing things from above or whatever. But generally speaking, the Stoics want us to think about the bigger picture and view things from a, a, a broader temporal perspective and spatial perspective. Because they rightly, I think, conclude that uh, one of the, the, the ironies of human nature is that, you know, we only see what's right in front of us and hear what's beside us, like our bodies limit us to just having these little slices of time and space. But our intellect knows that the universe is much vaster than this. So there's this kind of conflict between what we, what our bodies are telling us at any given time, the information we're getting from our senses, and the, the fact that intellectually we know that the, the whole universe is a much bigger story than this, and this is really just one fragment of it. And the Stoics think, well, Zeus, God, would be aware of the whole of space and time. So on the one hand, they think the philosophers, by trying to look at the bigger picture, are emulating Zeus. And this is kind of the goal of life. We should try and perfect wisdom by adopting this kind of cosmic divine perspective. But also, we're lying to ourselves. We commit a lie of omission. You know, it's a, it, it's a lie. We think of it as a lie when we say something that, that's just false to facts. But it's also a kind of lie when you leave out information. And uh, the sto for the Stoics, I think, that we're constantly telling ourselves lies of omission because we're constantly taking things out of context. 
we're constantly engaging in selective thinking because that's human nature. And they want to counter that by reminding themselves to view things as far as possible within this bigger picture, putting things back into the broader context. And they rightly understand that when you do that, and a lot of people, again, this needs to be explained to them that initially I know that people find this hard to grasp, but when information is put, bearing in mind that when we're anxious or stressed, we, we tend to threat monitor and focus on isolated things. We know that when you reverse that, it tends to dilute strong emotions. Um, one simplistic way of explaining that is that um, if you imagine that you're just looking at something that's kind of threatening and dangerous, you, you know, putting under a magnifying glass, you're going to react to that. If you broaden your perspective, and that's over there, but there's also calming and reassuring things dotted around it. So you have this rich tapestry, and your emotional response now is shaped by lots of different stimuli at once. You're going to have a more complex, nuanced, and moderate emotional response. But it takes a certain level of maturity to be able to take in that bigger, rounded, more complete picture. Right? You're never going to have the same kind of intensity of emotional reaction that you would if you ignored everything else and just vo focused in isolation on this one bad aspect. So broadening perspective inherently requires using more of your brain, if you like. It's kind of more challenging, but it's bound to balance out and moderate your emotional reactions if you, if you think about it that way. And I think, again, the Stoics were 2,300 years ahead of their time. And, and they, they had some intuition of that. Yes, um, <clears throat> being able to perceive the whole in that way is a very uh, important human capacity. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, probably a lot of uh, professional philosophers have overlooked this fact that if you go back to the Greek tradition and just say, for example, like look at the Pythagoreans and uh, Plato and then the Stoics, they're all actually very closely conjoined in this uh, sort of like underlying assumption that uh, philosophy itself is about understanding the relationship between the parts and the whole. And uh, today we're often focused on just the parts, but really to have a satisfying uh, life and a satisfying worldview, you have to have make some effort to see how the parts and the whole fit together. and. Uh, uh, if we uh, neglect the health of the whole, uh, it will definitely have some negative uh, consequences for us as a, as a species, I think. In any event, we've been talking for about an hour. I, ha I have one more question. Uh, and one thing is that in the future, I hope we can talk about uh, stoicism, love, and friendship, because that's another thing that relates to this uh, theme of emotions as well. And I know you've done some research into that. There's a lot of information on it. But, um, I, I just want to say, I remember when I was at university, a long time ago, like in Aberdeen, one of my lecturers introducing the subject of friendship, when we were talking about Aristotle, and he, I remember him saying with this kind of look of slight, you know, bemusement on his face, he said, like, modern philosophers aren't really interested in friendship. But for the ancient Greeks, it was one of the most important topics in philosophy. And that observation that he made always stuck in my mind. And it's true, it's not, and essentially not integral to modern philosophy or modern psychotherapy. I think that the Stoics and Socrates and the, the other uh, classical and Hellenistic philosophers are, are right. The, if we're going to understand self-improvement, then understanding what it, our relationships and understanding what friendship means is, is crucial. That's very important. And um, if you go back to Socrates, the way that he saw things was that dialogue was something that really took place among friends and it was a way of journeying together towards the truth. There's actually a, a good book about that called The Spiritual Art of Dialogue by uh, Robert Apatow. And he talks about this whole uh, Socratic uh, technique of dialogue and the elements that um, you know it, it encompasses. And uh, then with uh, Aristotle, if you look at his ethics, he, view, he viewed friendship as being uh, instrumental to living a good, uh, a happy life. Uh, and his chapters on friendship actually take up 20% of his books on ethics. So that shows you how important it is. And it goes on just through the Stoics and Seneca talks a lot about it. And, uh, and he, he's trying to show, uh, Seneca's trying to show in his letters to uh, Lucilius um, what an ideal kind of philosophical friendship could look like. And 
uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about too is that there's an epidemic of loneliness now. And I think it's because Aristotle, he talked about how there are three different levels of friendship and the highest level is based on uh, character. So you look at another person's character and you see things that you like in it and someone looks at your character and they see things that they like in your character. And then that's like the basis for a deep kind of real friendship rather than just uh, seeing what you can get out of another person in a utilitarian way or, or just feeling happy to be with someone. I mean, that, that that's fine, that's good. But I think there's this deeper level of friendship that um, the Greek philosophers were really committed to and it was really part of the whole philosophical experience. And I think that one of the reasons there might be so much loneliness uh, in the world today is because that level of friendship is something that seems to be lost in a way. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but when I was uh, researching, I discussed this in the first chapter of my book, it's called The Lost Art of Friendship. And I Googled um, uh, the phrase, uh, why don't I have any friends? And I found, I, I, I came up with like 5 billion results for that. So that, that seems to be somewhat alarming to me. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty shocking. Um, <laughs> I, there is some. I wonder, like, to what extent this is a cultural phenomenon, and but there, yeah, there are many things that we could say about this. I mean, in a way, I think it's just that to have that sort of relationship requires something like putting more, maybe putting more effort in, in a sense, to understanding people and empathizing with them and judging their character, and it, it's almost like a natural inertia, like we're bound to, if we don't have any incentive, you know, to think more deeply about relationships, there's a natural tendency just to kind of drift towards superficial relationships. Like we, we kind of need to be encouraged by our parents or educators or by society, you know, to, to, to look more deeply. And if nobody's kind of nudging us, like there's something about human nature that that makes us gravitate towards viewing things in this lazy kind of superficial level. And it leads to lazy superficial relationships. But like Marcus Aurelius talks about this idea as well of view, making an effort to, to view people's character as a whole and really understand what a person is like in lots of different situations, how they eat their meals, you know, how they relate to other people, you know, during good times and bad times, you know, how they sleep, you know, to picture the whole person and I, I notice there's a tendency in modern society to kind of respond to the appearance rather than re the reality and to judge other people just on like individual remarks that they say rather than interpreting those remarks in terms of their, their character as a whole. So generally there's a superficiality about things and I, I, I don't know, you know, maybe social media contributes to that or something about our culture contributes to it. But there's a, there's a laziness about it. There's a, it's social media in particular is full of people reacting to surface impressions and, you know, you know, quoting people out of context, misinterpreting what they say, jumping to conclusions about what they meant rather than kind of like trying to empathize with them and get behind their remarks, understand them at a deeper yeah. level. Yeah, it's very hard, um, for example, to have a conversation with someone on Facebook because uh, the, the way that people usually react is they just comment on things and there's a big difference between commenting on something and having a real conversation with someone and entering into a dialogue. And I just think that um, there's some sort of uh, innate human need for having, you know, deeper levels of friendship in the soul really. And that if that's not satisfied, then you're going to feel like you're disconnected uh, from people and social media could uh, certainly uh, exacerbate that feeling. But uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the really highest level of friendship is something that we see in sort of like, or a potential, the highest potential level of friendship is something that we see in the letters of uh, Seneca with uh, Lucilius, because they're actually trying to help each other become better people. Mm. And so if you were a member of a like ancient philosophical school, that would be sort of like the ideal level of friendship is that there would be other people who are there for you, uh, uh, you know, with your best interests in mind and, and trying to help you become the best person that you can. So, uh, it seems like friendship has been very, it's uh, that idea of friendship is no longer part of philosophy if you go into the academic world, but uh, 
and it might be uh, somewhat of a chaotic uh, <laughs> quest, but uh, I, you know, as one person, I would like to see that become part of philosophy again, because I think that really gives it a lot of depth that's uh, missing. So, so let me ask you one last question, because obviously you're well trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. So uh, that's part of uh, your world, but also uh, stoicism as a philosophy is very much a part of your world too. And so, uh, and obviously you see both as being very valuable and even related to one another, but how in your view is it that stoicism actually differs from cognitive behavioral therapy? I like that question as well. It's one I think about a lot. You know, the, the answer to it is very short in a way at one level. Stoicism is bigger, it's deeper. Like, so stoicism is a philosophy, cognitive therapy is a therapy. And, uh, you know, that, like, I like to think of things uh, uh, in people uh, in terms of this formula that, you know, someone's greatest strength is often their greatest weakness and vice versa. So the reason that the problem with doing stoicism in therapy is that its scope is very broad. It requires adopting certain values, like changing your fundamental worldview. So in some ways, it's kind of too deep and too broad to fit neatly into the consulting room context. But that's also its greatest strength uh, because often when people look at CBT, they think, oh, this is really cool. Like there's some profound psychological insights here, but I'm only using it to deal with my panic attacks. Or I'm only using it to deal with my depression. Now, what, why wouldn't this just apply generally across life as a whole? And it, it's always puzzled me about CBT. You know, I think inevitably you would look at it and think, if you really believe, for instance, that it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them, then what would the philosophy of life look like that was based on accepting the truth of that and, and applying it consistently across the board? And I'm always puzzled that cognitive therapists seldom ask that question. It's kind of like they compartmentalize things. I wrote that in my first book. I said, it's like they leave it in the consulting room, weirdly. And then, and then to some extent, they, they, they struggle with it and they try and think, what would happen if I lived my life in accord with this? But I, I think you'd end up with a philosophy of life that looks quite a lot like Stoicism. So the difference in part is that Stoicism as a philosophy has this broader, more pervasive uh, remit. And whereas cognitive therapy is inherently diagnosis driven, uh, like short, you know, short term, um, it's more compartmentalized. Generally, there's some exceptions to that. And so when we try and break out of that, we, uh, in part, is, is by doing things like resilience training, emotional resilience training, which tries to build up emotional toughness or makes people less vulnerable to developing mental health problems by uh, addressing the so-called normal population uh, before they have a diagnosis. And the prevention is better than cure, the holy grail of uh, psychotherapy, I like to say. But it, it, particularly if you take ideas from CBT and use them preventatively and across the board to build resilience, again, you end up with something that looks even more like stoicism. But what it lacks is even when people do resilience training, they go, look, here's a bunch of techniques you might find them useful. And it's presented in this kind of instrumentalist, sort of utilitarian way. Whereas in stoicism, it's like, no, like you would adopt these techniques because they're true. They're philosophical truths. Um, and once you really grasp that, then you would see the whole world through that lens rather than just thinking this is a useful thing to do a lot of. Like, so I think it's the further you push CBT to, to be more general, the more it becomes like stoicism, like a philosophy of life. And there are other differences, but that would be the main one. And I mentioned earlier, the CBT puts more emphasis on disputing the content of thoughts, whereas because stoicism wants to go a deeper, target things at a deeper level, it's more metacognitive, it's more meta-ethical. Um, it's more about addressing the, the, not the content of individual values, but the whole concept of how we uh, apply value across the board. Right. And uh, so, for example, like cognitive uh, therapy, it's very uh, solutions focused, whereas what we find in stoicism is that um, at its deepest level, it's about how do we develop a, an excellent character. So it has sort of a larger uh, you know, perspective than that. But it's very practical as well, because uh, 
you know, it's it's oriented to, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, the difficulties that cross our paths, you know, in, in life and uh, inevitably will, you know, affect us in one way or another. I'm thinking so, of an example, actually, from something we mentioned earlier. We talked about panic attacks and how when people have panic attacks, they might, they often believe they're going to have a heart attack and die. So a cognitive therapist might attempt to dispute or disprove that mistaken assumption, whereas a Stoic would be more likely to question whether death itself is as catastrophic as we assume. So the Stoics would target a much more fundamental, a philosophical level. Right, right. Well, uh, Donald, it's really uh, great speaking with you. We'll definitely speak again in the future. And um, I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, look at uh, the titles of Donald's books uh, beneath the video. And uh, if you enjoyed this conversation and you'd like to um, uh, hear more things like this, uh, do subscribe to the Stoic Insights uh, YouTube channel, uh, you know, select the notifications and also check out the Stoic Insights uh, website. And uh, it's been really great speaking with you. And uh, I wanna personally thank you for all of the really great work that you've done in helping to, you know, spread these uh, ideas. Uh, it's really amazing how the interest in Stoicism has uh, taken off in recent years, and you're one of the key figures behind that. And obviously, um, uh, what you have to say and what the ancient Stoics have to say are, are really addressing a real human need uh, in, our, in our modern times. So uh, there are a lot of people who are very thankful for all the work that you've done. Well, thank you very much. And then likewise, you know, thanks for everything that you're doing to promote these ideas and encourage people to engage with, uh, with classical literature and ancient philosophy. And uh, it's been a, been a pleasure talking to you. Okay, great. Well, we'll talk to you later then. Okay. Cheers okay, then. Bye. Okay. Bye.